Hi, I was on, um, uh, uh, online at the break, and I noticed this banner on, on one of the internet browsers, which said that we'd got the end of the world wrong according to the Mayan calendar. In fact, we had another 60 days, which I thought, great, another 60 days to realize our TED hopes and dreams. But it got me thinking how much we rely on future scoping. It's both a form of entertainment, but in other contexts, we take it very very seriously. And this isn't something new that we've just been doing, you know, with the advent of a, you know, an ever-changing world, globalization, climate change and that. Something we've been doing ever since we can remember. And I'm going to show you a specific example, which I'll, which I'll read, because um, I'd like to use this as a way of talking about what I'm doing. So according to Mr. Blainville, who usually is trustworthy, one can predict that in less than a hundred years, will Venice be totally united with the rest of Italy? And you can walk dry shod from Italy to the city. 1771. Now, what we're really bad at is predicting the future. But what we're really good at is somehow surviving it. Now, when I say we, I'm going to qualify that. I mean, life as we know it. According to scientists like Paul Davis, life itself was extinguished many times by violent asteroid showers before it finally established itself on the surface of the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago. The surface of the Earth is not kind. It's a very hostile territory. And for any structure to persist on its surface requires a huge amount of energy to do so. So, what makes life so resilient? The truth is, we don't know. But I think it has something to do with the fact that it's embodied. And somehow this embodiment equips it with the capacity to respond in a flexible and robust way to constant changes in the environment. And this strategy is completely different to the way that other structures persist. Take, for example, the city of Venice itself, based in northern Italy on the shores of a lagoon by the Adriatic Sea. Venice stands in apparent defiance of nature, the climate, the elements, and it does so not by virtue of its living properties, but of its allegiance with advanced technologies of the time. Of course, when the city-state of Venice was being founded between the 9th and the 12th century, these technologies were agrarian. In other words, they involved the drainage of land, the creation of canals, and the use of wooden piles to shore up the foundations of the developing settlement. And of course, they form an important feature of the city today. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, a new set of technologies exploded onto the scene, bringing great wealth and power to the city of Venice. And it did so by creating energy-intensive processes that subordinated matter to an atomic level of precision. And of course, that came with a huge environmental price, and one that Venice is still paying today. So perhaps, then, it is not surprising that there is protest against an industrial-scale intervention, a, a series of 78 mechanical gates that are there, a bit like the um, king of Denmark, King Canute, to hold back the sea and stop the Aqua, Al, uh, Aqua Alta from invading the territory of the city and bringing with it a huge amount of destruction. Environmentalists are really concerned about the impact that industrial technologies will have on the marine ecology and on the whole environment around the cityscape. So the city of Venice itself is situated in just about the most hostile environment on the planet. That is not, not in the middle of a volcano, it's actually the shoreline. The, the, the level um, of uh, damage between the, um, uh, the lowest part of the water level and the um, air and, and the changing levels of the sea creates a huge amount of destruction um, for, for Venice. Um, and, and this 
constantly in changing environment, which is compounded by water impacting quite physically on the structure of the city, as well as the chemical um, digestion that it brings along with it, has ravaged the infrastructure. Here you can see classic lion-like claw marks on marble round a door frame. Here you can see stucco that's literally been crumbled off the side of the building there, exposing the brickwork, which is equally destructive because once the brickwork is exposed, you get something called efflorescence on it, which is like a, a, a concentration of sodium chloride, salt from the water, which digests away the brickwork like your saliva would digest a biscuit. It becomes runny and, and it's kind of sandy and just formless. And, and this causes the Venetians to engage in all kinds of architectural desperation. You see holes in the wall in the city of Venice that are cannonball size. You can fit your fist into them. And they've been filled up with concrete, rubble, rubbish, even chewing gum. So is it all over for Venice? I mean, are we looking at a situation where it's going to join the fate of the mythological city of Atlantis. Well, after what I said at the beginning, I think it would be foolish of me to make any predictions. Um, but I will say that there is hope. Perhaps in an unlikely place, in the east of Venice, in a public garden, there is a tree. Let's go inside the garden and find this tree. Now, it's not an ordinary tree, as you'd expect. The tree is in the center of the building. You can see it there. And the building was constructed by an architect um, that was from Milan. Um, his name is Enrico Perasuti. And he created a building that was in the shape of a nautilus, which is a mollusk-like creature with a banded shell. Um, and actually looks like an octopus is living inside the banded shell. So in the center of the, of the shell is this oak tree with this beautiful ancient canopy. But outside, standing here, um, amongst his collaborators, is another architect, Philip Beasley. And he has created an installation for this space as part of the Venice Biennale. And this is Canada's entry um, to the exhibition. And you can see the name of the exhibition here. It's called the Hylozoic Ground. Now, Hylozoic is actually a very interesting term. It means life-bearing substance. So, um, let's go inside and see what's actually inside. So when we go inside, stand up and look, we notice that there's actually the natural canopy, oops, the, the natural canopy is visible through the, um, uh, through the glass roof of the, of the building. But underneath that canopy is a synthetic canopy. These, these tendrils here, these, these fluttery, feathery things with some golden fruit and some other structures. But we'll, we'll take another look at that. So we're going to look at the anatomy of, of what feels like a very jungle-like environment. So let's point out some features. Here are the giant swallowing tubes. These are hydraulically driven cybernetic structures that have proximity sensors on them. So when you approach them, they lift up furry tongues and they lick and tickle the inhabitants. Um, here we also have some artificial crickets. They're joined by um, a cybernetic network and a, a neural network that actually enables the um, uh, environment to sense the presence of people. And so when people are present, the crickets will sing and it actually contrasts the cicadas that are outside in the Giardini. Um, we also have um, this rather strange structure here, it's actually um, fingers of hygroscopic materials. They look not quite as dynamic as the interactive cybernetic jungle, but actually they're very active. They're drawing water from the environment, uh, environment into their substance. So essentially this jungle is semi-living. It senses the presence of the people and also environmental fluctuations. Um, another little example is that when um, airflow goes through the, through the building, those leaves throw up dust from the surroundings, and that's augmented by some of these LEDs um, picked out, and you actually see like a, a synthetic snow falling in the gallery. But let's look at this structure here a little bit closer. So we can see these are like golden fruit, and this is where the seed of Pandora's hope is sown, in my opinion. Within this fruit are some little seeds, and we'll go a bit closer to those again. And there we are. 
This is what they look like close up. So this is actually a very simple system. It's based on oil and water. And these seeds are indicators that actually some chemical changes are taking place. These chemical changes are based on environmental perturbations, like, for example, the content of carbon dioxide that's present in the gallery, both from the Venice water, which is actually being used as the water for constructing the um, installation, but also from the breath of the gallery visitors. So, and, and they're also then connected by um, a, an LED system so that the heat from the chemistry um, is, is, is sped up by the activation of the LEDs. Now, they don't look very dynamic as being oil and water droplets. They actually look quite static. But in the laboratory, they're actually very vigorous things. This is a film that was taken in the laboratory by my supervisor, Martin Hanzik. It's called a protocell. Essentially, this is oil and water droplet chemistry that is programmable. We can think of this one as being hardware. What it can do is exhibit lifelike qualities without any DNA. So it can move around its environment, it can sense it, and in this particular case, it can shed a skin. Now, I find this incredibly exciting because literally and figuratively, this is a kind of birth. And it's a birth of a new generation of technologies to follow the agrarian and the industrial technologies. This is a form of living technology. And essentially, this droplet literally wriggles free from its amniotic sac and comes into life. So I'm going to move on to the next slide, which says then, OK, so we've got this really cool hardware, which is wriggling around. It actually can move very fast if I don't engineer it to slow down and, and be large. Um, we can actually add different chemistries inside this oil droplet, which are released over space and time. In this particular picture, we've, we've actually got a, a green shell being grown. And that's grown by fixing carbon dioxide in solution, again, from Venice water and um, carbon dioxide that's been dissolved in that water from the breath of the gallery visitors. I've made it green because it um, contrasts much better than white, which is the limestone-like um, substance that it would normally create if we, if we use calcium salts. So can we use this in a practical situation? Well, what I did was I gathered up some brick fragments in Venice, I put them in a Petri dish, and programmed little protocells to actually create a limestone-like substance this time. And you can actually see it's creating a scar-like material, a band of white material between the brick fragments. Um, and it's starting to read its surroundings in different states of activity. Again, it's based on the production of carbon dioxide. And you can actually see that even within this very small space, um, the dis uh, dissolution of carbon dioxide is actually quite varied. So essentially, this is a technology that can produce not only knitting together of brickwork, but also could create a protective shell around it. Um, and, and we're actually talking to a paint company about this at the moment, but I'll show you it in a different context, this kind of technology being used. This is a, a technology called BioRock. It works on a very similar principle. This technology is based on a metal framework which is put into the seawater, and then a low voltage current is run through it. And when that happens, you actually get the creation of a concrete-like substance around it, which can actually grow up to two centimeters a year. Very, 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 very thick, um, very strong structure. Um, and, and this is used to graft um, corals onto um, in parts of the sea that have been damaged by cyanide fishing and explosive fish fishing, which has ruined a lot of coral reefs, say, like out in Bali. So scaling this up architecturally, one can think of how we could use living technology in a, as a qualitatively different kind of approach to creating survival strategies for the city of Venice that are different to the industrial ones that are being proposed. So here we have a speculative project which um, relies on releasing protocells into the lagoon and into the um, canals, where they're activated by light, and they move into the darkened foundations of the city, which of course are around the wood piles, where they start to create their shell-like structures. After that, um, we, we monitor and we um, kind of uh, uh, engage with the marine ecology and make sure that there are no adverse effects. This would be a project that would happen over a number of years. Um, but gradually, you would get accretion 
of the technology and the creation of petrification around the woodpiles. And essentially what this is doing, it's stopping the weight of the city of Venice from sinking into the soft delta soils through the woodpiles, which are acting a bit like stiletto shoes, and turning them into platform boots. So we're stopping the city uh, attenuating its um, sinking into the muds by creating this strategy. And what is also very interesting about this, I think, is it, it, it demonstrates the principle, I think, that's going to be very important in all kinds of cities in the future. And that is, I think we're going to see a whole new generation of technologies for retrofitting. We won't be destroying cities through demolition processes as we currently see, but we'll actually be reskinning, recladding, reworking the materials, the very substance of the cities themselves. So this is a future um, Venice um, and as you can see, that the protest cell technology has done its job underneath the foundations. And through capillary action, through evaporation, and just th through the general changing of the sea level, we actually see the emergence of protocell like structures, um, even forming um, stalactites and stalagmites underneath the Rialto Bridge there. Um, but in a very practical way as well, these living technologies have other values. So, for example, we could use them to create self-healing materials around um, buildings in the air. They may also be able to trap carbon dioxide and build up artificial shell-like structures, which would improve the thermal insulation qualities of buildings. These surfaces could also be programmed using completely different chemistries so that they could produce water in desert-like situations. Additionally, we could even go as far as creating solar fuels using sunlight and carbon dioxide and create a new generation of solar panels. So what I think is really interesting about this is how much of our city planning and our notions of sustainable cities is based on our propensity to future scope. And what I think is really neat about living technology is that it doesn't pretend to know the future. Living technology is a way forwards in an, in an age of architectural and environmental uncertainty, not by pretending to know the future, but responding in real time to ongoing changes in the environment, just like life itself does. Thank you.